Hey everybody, my name is Eric. Welcome to Montreal Connects. Uh, very excited about what we're going to do today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce my guest, my esteemed guest, Mirko Hornung. I, I hope I've got the pronunciation right uh, in, in, my, in my Canadian English. Uh, from Bauhaus Luftart, Luft, Luftfar. I, I again want to make sure I have that correct, uh, but you can correct me. Welcome. How you doing? Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And everything's right. So it's Mirko Hornung. I'm heading Bauhaus Luftfahrt, which is a kind of aviation think tank. So I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Excellent. I think we have a little presentation video and then we will come back and we will talk. Yeah, so thanks. So I, I will just give a brief overview because I'm currently in the position also to represent Munich Aerospace here and uh, which is an organization which is trying to connect the different regions of the world. And this is what we consider under the global aerospace campus. So where we do together between different regions of the world, which are very strong in the aerospace domain, doing conferences, doing online courses for teaching, and also trying to establish research cooperation. So, so this is also a very nice platform for us to connect the people and to bring them in new topics. And especially one of the topics which is um, highlighted here on the screen, which is the urban air mobility, I will, I will just in a couple of minutes uh, try to give you a little bit more of an insight. So this does show the regions that are connected um, under that Global Aerospace Campus. So it's under the Regional Leaders Summit. So really the top regions in the world that are addressing aerospace sciences. And, and this is where we try to connect it and, and get a common view, a common research goal, and try to bring, let's say, the, the latest know-how of the, all the different regions um, to the students, but also to the researchers. So that's part of the story. So how we do it, we have different topics. So we have the Global Aerospace Campus, which is our, let's say, our home for all the kind of lectures of all the information providing um, to the people. And then we have also dedicated research topics. So you see the three ones that are currently running. So uh, renewable energy is something which will attract everybody of us because this is where we have to deal with in the future. Our small satellites, which is something which is popping up. So um, and also the big topic of digitalization. So this is something uh, that we especially see in our domain, which is one of the, the key topics. So this is a little bit telling the story about how we connect on, on a global scale. And um, now as a brief introduction, the, the urban air mobility, something which is and could be a future new mode of mobility. And what I tried to just get a little bit of a glimpse of what it could be and, and where also some of the, the obstacles or challenges are, where we need to connect in a global sense really to, to work on the solution. So what is it? And this is just a brief sketch. So everybody on, on urban mobility always um, thinks about air taxi, so passenger transport, but it can be also other topics like emergency medical services. So making use of getting quickly to somebody who is in, in need services like on the logistics side. So the key element is we have a flying element, which has been in the past. The helicopter is new technology now providing a solution that can have different aspects, different functionality, uh, also getting a little bit more of, let's say, noise reduction, energy reduction, getting a better environmental footprint. And that's about the story. In order to make it work, because in the end, it's a solution for society, uh, we have to work on different topics. So it's, it's on the one hand side, and this is always prominent, it's the vehicle, it's, it's the flying air vehicle, it's the air taxi. But it's also very close connect to infrastructure, vertiports. How do you get access to that new mode of operation? It's how to handle the traffic in the air traffic management. It's, it's definitely a part. And that's really to ensure the safety. And this is mandatory if we talk about passenger transport. That's it. At the same time, in the current discussion, in the global discussion about sustainability, this is also a part and, and so on. So you see the facets that get into, let's say, kind of new mobility system is quite challenging. And just to get a little bit of an insight of where we are today. So that's not new. And there have been ideas around to get somehow a flying car, a flying taxi, um, a capability of a person um, just to fly from A to B instead of, of driving just a car. So you see there's quite some history in there. 
it has already been in operation and we have vehicles um, that allow vertical takeoff and landing and higher cruise speeds, which are helicopters. And it has been a business model in the past. Um, and also it's currently is, and you see on the right hand side, the example of Woom, uh, where you have a new model. And, and just by, let's say, teaming up with mobility providers, which give access like the Uber app, and just to make such kind of transport accessible, um, immediately raised the revenue bar by 400%. So it, it's not about just having the opportunity, but also having easy access to the opportunity to use something like that. But nevertheless, it's, it's the helicopter and in the, let's say, in the society, helicopter is always considered as loud somehow. So you have to also tackle with higher costs and so on. So this is something where new technologies, and this is just examples, so electrification, batteries, new sensors, new communication, higher computational powers. What does the, let's say, technological environment change in that kind we do the business with respect to mobility if we talk about urban mobility like air taxis? And, but it's really about also getting a market pull from the side because what we see on the road is you have increased congestion. But this is something I would like to stress from the very beginning. Uh, I don't think we will be able to get around that. It's just to fly across it. So it's just about how we tackle with the situation. So we won't resolve really the problem on the ground. Uh, you want to get easy access, especially if you have dedicated positions like airports, for example, or dedicated points of interest. So where you normally don't have too good ground connectivity, this is something where a solution like an air taxi could help. And also charter operations for tourist companies or whatever, wherever you want to have a kind of premium service, a different view on, on uh, where you're going and so on. So this could also be options uh, where there's a stronger need in personalized travel. And, and this is to some extent also driving a demand for that new solutions. But where we are, so the need is clear. So you can talk to a lot of people and they say, oh, they would be highly interested to get access to that additional speed, to, to that additional comfort, to get into a city much quicker than we have it today. So what is the technology level and, and where do we are? So what you can see over here is really the high amount of initiatives that are currently running to investigate different aspects of that kind of, let's say, urban air mobility. So bringing air vehicles into an urban environment to provide it as a transport solution. So we are talking in the order of 200 initiatives worldwide with different aspects to that. So you see already also in the, the dark color code, a lot of companies already getting engaged in there. So there, there seems to be really a kind of sort of business drive to make use of that technology change. And um, once we look into the different approaches that are taken, we are still seeing a very mixed heterogeneous field of, of vehicles that are discussed. So from the, let's say, conventional aircraft type, so fixed wing aircraft, which still needs a runway, so which is kind of a little bit of a drawback or limitation uh, to make that use, up to different types of vertical um, flight vehicles. And you see some examples on the right hand side. So the Volocopter solution is one where you have small fixed rotors, a quite simple system, but they also are the first ones that did get certification to fly. So this is something which can already be used operationally. Um, the latest design from Joby Aviation, so a kind of a hybrid vehicle where you have vertical flight capabilities, but still a wing to make use of more efficiency during cruise flight. So also enabling um, longer ranges with a higher speed, so reducing flight times by that. And then uh, what I would consider, the, let's say, a little bit of a conversion of the classical uh, flying car concept, so we, where you have more of the aircraft capabilities, but still the capabilities for vertical takeoff. So the key is really to get access to smaller spots in cities, around cities, but make use of a flying vehicle to increase the speed. This all so brings us to the point we have to integrate it somehow. And if we take helicopter services as they are existing today, this is the picture that we see. So we have helipads, we have single passengers getting in and out of the helicopter. So this is 
rather, let's say, low frequency operation. If we really want to bring it to a market with higher market share in intercity and also interregional traffic, we need to get a bigger throughput. So this kind of model will most likely not work because we will need too many vehicles and too many um, vertiports really to make it happen. And we really have to think of how do we integrate it. We see already some first prototypes and some concepts and you already see like um, the, the Uber concept on top on the right hand side, we have multiple um, takeoff and landing pads and that's connected to kind of um, standing pads where you have the operation with the passenger. That allows you with a limited amount of really operational helipads or vertipads to increase the capacity of a given infrastructure um, to provide enough throughput. And in the end, to make a viable business case, that's mandatory because you have to move quite a larger amount of people into the air really to pay off because this is something we have to keep in mind um, to make it on, on a larger scale a viable product. We have to bring costs down closely to what we are used to in the taxi domain. So if we get into a cab, into a taxi, we are somehow used around $2 to euros per passenger kilometer. So this is the benchmark and this is the order of magnitude where we need to get. Currently on the helicopter side, we are somewhere uh, fivefold, so around $10, 10 euros per passenger kilometer. So there's still a way to go and we have to make the technology for that. The second aspect is the current airspace, especially above cities, is not made for heavy flight operations. So we have a system which is more or less regulated with classical aircraft and we have to find solutions how we can organize it. There are a lot of initiatives around um, that think of how this could be best managed. And it's not really about looking at, let's say, smaller drone operation. It's really talking about passenger and larger freight carrying vehicles. So we have to get dedicated measures in place to make it safe because not only for the person on board, but if you have a larger vehicle flying across a heavy congested city, you want to make sure that it's not falling down. And this is something that we definitely need to account for. And there are a lot of initiatives uh, on the European side. EASA is working on that in the US, it's FAA. And that's really highest priority, like we had it in aviation for decades now, safety first. And this is something that we need to consider. But that's not all. So the technical solution is one side. The other one is really to bring it into service to make it a viable business. And this is once we talk about ecological, social and economic challenges behind it. And um, again, what I already stressed is the, let's say the target on the cost side. So the target is really to get in the amount and the payment range of a taxi of a cab. The other one is on the environmental impact. And um, this is something which is, is quite crucial in that respect. Um, we have to acknowledge that we have to bring the vehicle in the air first. And this definitely needs power and needs energy. And if you just do a comparison and the um, lowest bar over here is an air taxi. So if you take something which is designed for poor passengers, and just operate it with one passenger. So this is the big gray part of um, kilowatt hours per passenger kilometers that you create. And if you now compare it to something which we are used to on the, let's say, mass transportation in the cities, we are orders of magnitudes away from that. So, so it's really an environmental issue. So, so we have to get full electric with full sustainable electrical energy to make it work. Because otherwise, if we go for other solutions, it will never be ecologically in a scope where it would be acceptable under the boundary conditions that we see today. So this is also why you only see that big push on the electrification. The second one is the noise level. And um, especially if we are fly flying above populated area, we have to consider that. That has been one of the, let's say, big penalties that is seen with helicopters. So we have to get noise levels down because this is one of the key drivers with respect to acceptance of the of the population. And um, so 
it's still at a level where there's a high uncertainty. Some of the vehicles already demonstrated that they are more silent than classical helicopters, but there are also concepts around which seem to be much noisier than um, current helicopters, just in different frequency domains. And we still have to estimate what does it mean with respect to operation? How high do you have to fly also not to form a kind of a visual object in, in the frame? Because what we would do, we would now translate the traffic, which is currently covered in the valleys between the buildings, bring it up into the air and make it visible to everybody. And this is something that we have to keep in mind if somebody has seen the film, The Fifth Element knows what I mean. So this is exactly what will be happening and we have to deal with the situation. And it will be affecting a lot of people. And the problem is always who gains from that new solution and who is affected in a negative way. And we have to find a balanced way because it doesn't pay off if it's just a small group of people that will be able to afford it to use that um, new way of transportation, but a larger community is suffering from something which would be noise or something else. So this is still a little bit unknown and it still has to evolve over time if this can really get the backing from the society. And this is something where we have to work on and this is also why it's very important to work on demonstrators and to really see is there something uh, where we get it. And this is somehow also showing it a little bit on the different, let's say, target groups of that. If you take um, urban air mobility as a mobility as a service, so this is more in the broader scope. So more people just getting to a city, make use of it as a common standard mobility um, means. Or do you want to evolve it as a premium service? And this would lead to a situation where you have different aspects, high comfort, high speed, but very limited amount of users of that. And this in contrast to who is affected. And urban taxi service, this is something which is a little bit the common goal of most of the activities right now, really to make it accessible at an elevated cost compared to a personal vehicle. But nevertheless, you have that service of increased speed and more flexibility on, on using it. So again, the four points um, that we have to stress, and this will definitely show off. And, and we, are especially on the safety issue, we have to raise the, the topic um, that especially the, the older approaches of using helicopter for that kind of services, they have been stopped due to some crashes. And it's a simple question, what will happen once the first air taxi would crash, what would be the impact? And, and this is something that we have to avoid. So we have to be very serious on safety issues because it's a flying vehicle. It's somehow connected um, to a kind of, let's say, natural respect of people uh, operating that and uh, they don't want to definitely affect safety in their behavior. And also about the balance in the community, uh, which we already addressed before. So. Infrastructure, we also need to invest, and this is also a very important part. It's not done by just putting that kind of vehicle in the market because you have to build up the complete ecosystem from the vertiport, from the booking systems, from the connections, from the connection to the ground transportation means to that flying network. So it's not about just getting an air vehicle, put it on an existing um, runway and make it fly. So that's a complete different story. And this is what we have to keep in mind, which is also important for the investment that have to be taken. It's not about bringing just an air vehicle into the air. It's, it's much bigger than that. And so in the end, it's a very complex activity. It's, it's very challenging. Um, it nevertheless, it provides some additional features that we haven't seen in the market, especially for mobility services in the past. And it's really about um, getting our utmost attention to all the different aspects and try to bring in our expertise and also ideas how to best tackle those challenges to make it work. And it has an option uh, to be successful, but still there are some, some hurdles and we have to keep them in mind and, and don't be too pushy, especially not on the, on the safety side especially to make it work because this is something which we have learned in aviation 
uh, if we don't put safety first, uh, we will fail definitely. And and this is something that we need to do. And um, that's about it. That's just as a brief summary of how we see urban air mobility. And this is also um, the story about why we want to bring it on a, on a global scale and their upcoming collaborations um, between the different regions really to push that technology. And this is something which is very exciting. And, and I guess we have a lot of uh, potentials for collaboration in there. I can't hear you. There we go. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. Thank you very much for that presentation. I had po I had uh, muted myself because I didn't want to distract anyone from anything that you had to say. Um, this is really an interesting area of study, which I have to admit, I have less knowledge clearly than someone such as yourself. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and by the way, if people are in the chat, I see uh, we've had a couple of people, uh, Bonjour de Montréal, which uh, if you speak French means hello from Montreal. Um, and, uh, and, and so people are watching. Uh, they may have questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, please let us know in the chat. Uh, my first question to you, uh, and you kind of, you know, you, you, you broach the subject, but I'd like to understand a little bit further is um, the, the, the takeoff and, you know, the, the access for people to takeoffs, uh, landings and takeoffs. Uh, how many different spots, I guess you were talking about Ventiports, but what about for, you know, if I am someone in Montreal, where I am right now, and I want to go from the east end of the city to the west end of the city, um, how many different ports are you going to need for me to be able to access that easily enough that it's that it's better for me to do that than to take uh, a car or a taxi or, or any other means of transportation? That, that's a quite difficult question to answer because um, we have done a kind of investigation just for Bavaria itself and, and did take a look and how you can spread it. It always depends a little bit how you have access to some of the, let's say, classical transport means. So if you put it in the city, for example, um, if you put it very close to where you have mass transportation anyhow, like a, a fast railway system or something um, like a subway station, um, that could be very easy because then in that case you can reduce the amount of vertiports that you need because you have that, let's say, feeder traffic already coming uh, with a quite fast and efficient way. If you're more outside, it will be part of the problem how to get to the vertiport and get away from that. And this is also something where we consider a very high synergy uh, with other technologies that come up, like like autonomous um, driving, for example. So you've got autonomous cars, you can easily connect those measures. And in that case, what we normally talk about is you should have an access to something in like 10, maximum 15 minutes to you. And that will define, depending on the infrastructure of the city, somehow the network of vertiports that you would need. Well, that, that perfectly answers my question. So this is absolutely feasible. Um, and, and we have some questions from the chat now, so I'd, I'd love to give uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the conch to uh, people in the chat. So the first question that I see from uh, John Byron um, is, uh, how do you see the increase in drone population affecting this type of urban air commuting? So for leisure, surveillance, delivery, etc. And that, that's one of the core problems. And, and this is also part of the problem, how we tackle a kind of, a, of an air traffic management above cities. And uh, this is something which is already discussed quite heavily. So that also those kind of delivery drones and other drones, you need a kind of, of active um, communication. So you need a situational awareness of all the players around. And it's very likely that also like on the classical airways, you will have kind of protected zones uh, for passenger carrying flights if you have a more regular traffic. So um, there are different solutions, but uh, it will definitely be an active situation awareness thing and also protected areas for, for some of the, the routes that are really highly frequent. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, another question that's come up a couple of times now, uh, you talked about electrification. Um, are some of the projects that you're using uh, or some of your projects using hydrogen as well? 
Um, for the time being, it's not used that much. There are some ideas um, to use also fuel cell, but it's, it's always a combination. So especially in that size of, of air vehicles, what you normally would do, um, you would use a fuel cell to still go with an electric system, um, which would not work, let's say, on much bigger systems, but this is something which is investigated. But for the time being, most of the, let's say, feasibility demonstrators that are currently around, um, as you can decouple the fuel cell and the hydrogen from the, let's say, testing phase, because still you convert it to electrical energy, you start with the electric way first, and then you mature the system, and then it's one possibility to, to extend the range by putting a fuel cell system and a, and a hydrogen system on board. But also, if you use a fuel cell, it's still okay, because you just generate water as an emission, uh, but other systems are a little bit critical, and this is also why I mentioned, especially from the environmental perspective, you have to get on fully sustainability, and uh, that's one of the key targets. Right. Uh, well, a another question from uh, Alexa Smith is, what technical advancements are needed to make this whole thing viable? I mean, that's a pretty yeah, that, big that's, question. That's, that's, a very, that's a very good question, because um, in the overall context, the the electrical system to a large extent would enable that already. The, the key problem is um, how can we make those systems reliable and, and to a kind of standard that we can also bring the cost down. And, and this is one of the key elements um, because I, I mentioned the target. So within a helicopter system, which is a kind of an established technology, we are somewhere in that $10, 10 euros per passenger kilometers. We have to bring it down to get to a viable business model to somewhere around a fifth of that. So around $2, two, two euros per passenger kilometer. So, so this will be the challenge, keeping the high demand, high power, high quality, high safety standards, at the same time getting into mass production. And this is also where we see uh, a, a very close link between the aviation sector and the automotive sector, because they are used more in mass production, bringing prices down on the other side. The aviation part is that one on the high performance and also high safety level standards. Uh, again, thank you for that answer. Uh, we're, we're about three minutes away from wrapping up. I have one last question that, uh, you know, from your presentation uh, sprang to mind. Um, you mentioned uh, at one point uh, the fifth element. Uh, and then when I was looking at some of the designs, the early designs, uh, you know, the flying cars, it made me think of the Jetsons. So I'm wondering how much of, you know, the, our, our collective pop culture um, uh, and, and collective consciousness has, has come into play in the design of some of these solutions? Yeah, it's, it's still around because there's also a kind of, let's say, idea behind it. And you still see it also in some of the, the concepts that are around. Um, in the end, and um, this will be also a kind of a down selection over, I would say, the next decade to come. Not everything that looks fancy does fulfill all the requirements that we that we have seen, that we have listed before. And some of the things do work in a demonstrator or in a, just in a feasibility demonstrator and just to show that it's feasible, but it will not pay off in the end. And, and this is what we will see in the next decades. But it's good that we see a variety of concepts right now, some very fancy, some more conventional, and it will fuse somehow. There will be some elements coming from the more fancy ones that get into the more conventional and, and we see some kind of, a, of a, let's say, evolution of some of the concepts. Great. We have two minutes left, but I do have one last question. One more for safety, and this is from Alexa Smith. Are there ideas around ejecting passengers if there's uh, issues, you know, parachutes and things like that? Uh, and about two minutes left. There might be a lot of ideas around it. It's just about the question if it's reasonable to do it, especially for the passengers. It's, it's rather um, would be a good idea, and this is also what is considered um, to find solutions to bring the system safely down without damaging somebody on the ground. Because if you take a vehicle which is somewhere around two tons, even if you eject the passenger, you don't want to have two tons crashing on the ground. And, and that's about it. So you really have to consider um, what you can do really to safely ensure also the situation on the ground. 
Well, all of this is absolutely fascinating. I'm going to do a lot of research about this. This was a, a field that I wasn't aware of how much it's grown. Um, there's just about a minute left, so I, I want to say thank you uh, for taking the time. Uh, you were so perfectly timed in your 20 minutes, and then we've had time for the chat. But uh, just in the last 30 seconds that we have left, anything else that you want to add, uh, anything you want to impart to the, to, to the folks watching? No, just keep eager and, and also think about new ways. There are always new technologies that do enable also some radical ideas. So don't be just too conservative, take some risk. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, it was great to have you. Thank you.